contingency budget, as we talked about, is when a, when a budget fails, as Enrique shared. Uh, there are no provisions for a revote this year because of the timing. Uh, the executive order from the governor did not establish uh, any provisions um, thereof. So it's expected and therefore assumed that if a budget failed, the district immediately adopts a contingent budget. Uh, the slide you're looking at is something that we're very, very proud of. This is uh, just a basic sample of our program and uh, what and what we value uh, in terms of um, return on investment in Hendrick Hudson. Uh, we have around 2,300 students. Uh, about 60% of our students play, uh, play an athletic sport. Uh, more than 80% of our students who take AP classes, any one of the 24, uh, are eligible for college credit. Uh, an average class size of 19 students is incredible. I'm not going to read them all to you, but we should be very, very proud of the return on investment that our community is receiving um, in terms of their tax investment and these outcomes. But when a school budget fails, as Enrique mentioned, uh, programs and services are reduced or eliminated. That is basically uh, done through layoffs. Uh, as he also just shared, we would have to reduce 2.6 million in expenses uh, between the date we certify the vote uh, and budget uh, to July 1st. Uh, and again, um, no revote or revised budget. Uh, some unknown things that are important that we would need to charge a facilities use structure for outside organizations. So uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the town of Cortland, uh, any organization, uh, dance studios, you name it, um, any organization that uh, wants to use district facilities, uh, we would need to charge them based on uh, how much it costs us to keep those facilities open. Uh, and again, these are groups that we've had long-standing agreements with. Uh, expenses in the budget need to be tied directly to the safe legal day-to-day -day operation. Uh, and we would not be allowed to spend any of our budget dollars on extracurricular activities, uh, summer school, again, except for special education students, so on and so forth. So uh, right there, some, some very big changes in what the community and parents could expect. $520,000 of essential equipment would need to be uh, eliminated. That could be supplies, materials, technology. Uh, but more than a half a million dollars of uh, materials that we deem necessary to support an instructional program would be eliminated. So let's talk about school program requirements, mandated versus non-mandated. Uh, these are the New York State Commissioner's regulations, not my regulations, not the school boards, not Westchester County's. New York State Commissioner regulations, and I'm just going to highlight some of these. Kindergarten is not mandatory. There are no provisions in the commissioner's regulations that we provide uh, kindergarten for our students. Art, music, library teachers in the elementary school are not mandatory. Their curriculum and learning standards are mandatory, not who delivers that curriculum and instruction. That's uh, very important to underscore that our elementary teachers could become art, music, and library teachers as well. Uh, in the middle school, we have some minimum seat time requirements in art, music, library, home and careers, and technology. Uh, we exceed those minimums right now, uh, certainly exceed them in art and music. In high school, to graduate uh, with a New York State diploma, you only need 22 credits to graduate in New York State. Many of our students are graduating in upwards of 28 to 32 to even 35 credits. The high school has a nine period schedule. One of those periods typically is for lunch. So if uh, you're a fully subscribed high school student for four years and you're taking eight classes a year, uh, you essentially could graduate with 32 credits or 10 credits more than the minimal state requirement. Uh, and uh, it is not required uh, to have programs of our own in our district. I touched on this earlier, but special ed programs like ABC and special class programs do not need to take place in Hendrick Hudson. They can be outsourced, meaning we could send our students to other schools or other locations where they receive their instruction. Uh, this has been a priority of our board and community for quite some time 
to not do that, uh, to build our own programs and educate our own students within uh, their own community. As well as the uh, academy and alternative programs at the high school, um, if, if you are a student uh, with an IEP that, that states you need to have uh, an alternative setting, that does not necessarily mean it has to take place in our high school. Uh, there are alternative high schools and alternative programs throughout the region. So again, um, it is not mandatory that we educate all of our students uh, within the four walls of our schools, and that certainly um, is, an, is not mandated. So at the elementary, I'll just highlight these. Uh, again, kindergarten is not mandatory. Uh, the ones with asterisks are important that they're only mandated if a student has an IEP or a 504. And I'll tell you that uh, many, many students that do not have an IEP or a 504 benefit from the, uh, the skill of reading teachers, social workers, psychologists, and speech improvement. Uh, Horizons, our enrichment program at the elementary, is not mandated, nor are teaching aides and assistants, nor are school nurses. Um, we do not have to have a school nurse in each of our three elementary schools. At the elementary, uh, I'm sorry, at the middle school level, it grows a little bit. Uh, we have more school counselors than the state education department ratio. Uh, again, you'll see some uh, standard uh, positions especially those with asterisks. Band, orchestra, and chorus are not mandated. The, the, the actual student experience of performing in a band, performing in an orchestra, and performing in a chorus are not mandated experiences. Uh, exposure to music coursework is a mandate, but not performing groups. Art, music, and technology, uh, athletics, and extracurricular activities, so our modified sports programs are not mandated. And again, teacher, teacher, teacher assistants and aides, and again, school nurse is not mandated in a middle school. Uh, in a high school, uh, again, left, left side is, is pretty much the same. Uh, school counselors um, at a ratio of 1 to 250. Uh, we certainly exceed that in then some, so we would not need to um, retain all of our school counselors. And then on the right side, uh, especially those first handful, um, are, are somewhat cringeworthy. Project Lead the Way in Science Research. These are college programs through Rochester Institute of Technology and University of Albany. Those are elective programs. They're not mandated. Not one of those courses satisfies a New York State diploma requirement. Our advanced placement courses and our dual credit courses that we have relationships with a plethora of, co of colleges and universities, those are also electives. They're not mandated. Uh, we do not need to offer them uh, and certainly um, could be subject to reduction if the budget didn't pass. Again, uh, performing in band, chorus, and orchestra, we have many electives in art, music, technology, and business that exceed the state requirements. Uh, in fact, we have AP classes in art, in music, and technology uh, that certainly aren't mandated. Again, uh, teacher aides and assistants, as long as they're not uh, delivering a service through an IEP. A school nurse is not mandated at the high school. Uh, and again, our athletics program for ninth graders through 12th graders uh, and all the extracurricular activities and stipends, National Honor Society, Seed Club, uh, Math Honor Society, you name it, those are not mandated uh, um, opportunities or um, mandated programs that the district needs to fund. So uh, again, just coming back to where we started, uh, many of those programs, well, all of those programs are not mandated and could be at risk. And what would happen is if the budget failed, uh, by the time we certified that vote, we would have until really June 30th to make the reductions, notify those staff members, notify the families, because many of the students, especially at the high school, have gone through the registration process uh, to uh, fulfill their schedule obligations for the following year. Uh, and and uh, we would have a lot of reshuffling to do throughout the organization. Um, when you lay off staff, uh, it goes by seniority. I know I read something somewhere that uh, suggested we should lay off certain people and only people that don't live in our community. Uh, both of those would be completely illegal. Uh, 
when you lay off uh, employees, especially those uh, representing New York State by a labor union, uh, it is by seniority, and where they live has absolutely nothing to do with their seniority. Um, so we have an active seniority list. Laura keeps that with Fran Dodaro, and uh, Enrique also has that for certain staff, and that's basically how it's done. Um, we look at what programs and, and uh, what programs we want to provide for the following year. Uh, we would go through a process of, of reducing various programs to back into the number that the state mandates we reduce our budget. Uh, so, you know, everyone's entitled to have their opinions, uh, but I think facts, when we get to this standpoint, are really important. Um, you know, we, we can only provide uh, the facts as they are given to us from from the New York State Education Department, and in this case, uh, the, the slides you just saw are from commissioner's regulations. We have an obligation to, to fulfill the minimal requirement according to the commissioner regulations, and we should be very proud that we live and work in a community that more than exceeds those um, expectations or, or minimal uh, expectations. Um, we have students coming from districts far and wide who uh, attend our programs, whether they're special education programs or ABC programs, partnering with us in athletics. Uh, every year we receive an inquiry to see if some uh, students from local districts could participate in our Project Lead the Way or Science Research programs. Uh, we try to make that happen if, if we can accommodate their schedule. Um, you know, I, I've said for a number of years, Hendrick Hudson is a destination district, uh, one of the most affordable suburban Westchester districts with uh, programs that I don't think any high school in a 10 mile radius uh, could match up against. Um, so there are there are real uh, repercussions uh, that will be felt throughout the organization. And sadly, they'll be felt in the classroom. Uh, because as, as we've said and we've articulated over the last number of meetings, um, we can't continue to turn the heat down. Uh, we can't put more kids on a bus to uh, take buses or staff off the road. And that this board has done an incredible job over the last 8 to 10 years of keeping our expenses around a 2% increase. And um, those are at risk. Those are, are gravely at risk. So, thank, thank you, Joe. Yes. Um, Bill, you're up first with questions, comments. Uh, yes, I have a simple question, Joe. Thank you very much. A, a nice presentation. The you mentioned bringing in students from other districts. I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't understand um, how that works. Um, my understanding is quite often we're doing that because if we set up a special class for our students that maybe hypothetically can handle eight students, but we only have five of our students that need it, we might accept a couple other students from other districts that are going to pay us tuition to help to defer our costs. Is that correct? And maybe elaborate that on that because I think people are probably asking why are we having other students come to our district? Um, when we're paying the court, but I think they need to understand that there's some benefit to us for that. Yeah. So um, what happens? Let, let me let me speak generally, and if Lisa's still with us, she can fill in the fill in the gaps. Generally, what happens when a when a school district, uh, let's just use special ed as an example, needs to place a student out of district because their home district doesn't have their program. Uh, they'll do a, a process, we call it, they send out packets. It's basically a profile of the student uh, based on some very significant uh, and specific diagnostic data. And they'll send those packets to programs that service students with, those particular, with that particular profile. Uh, Lisa or her team would receive it, would first determine if, if we have... Um, space in the classroom given you know commissioner regulations and and requirements uh to that degree uh lisa and her staff would actually send a team to go observe the student uh just to you know collect some observational data talk to the teacher uh talk to other folks in the school to make sure that this potential uh new student would be a fit 
And then if they are a fit, <clears throat> um, the, the CSC would recommend the placement to our district, and we essentially have a financial agreement with that other school district, and, and their board of education approves it, and our board of education approves it. So in our ABC program alone, last year we had 11 students, K through 12, uh, that were not Hendrick Hudson students, and they came and, and they paid tuition. Next year there's going to be one more, so 12 students. Uh, I know we have a lot of middle schoolers in our uh, various special ed programs at middle school that come from neighboring districts uh, because uh, we can provide the service that their home district can't. And I don't know, Lisa, if I, if I missed any, please uh, fill in the gaps. I think one of the most important things on top of being an appropriate program is to make sure we're doing a least restrictive environment. So sending them to a both um, sometimes the, the school district BOCES is out in Somers. So if we're getting a kid from Pocanico, if we're getting a kid from um, Fort Chester, Hastings, that's an awful long drive for them to send them to a BOCES program that's in a school district. Um, our partners around us, A, like us because we're central and we can, they can get to us in a, in a timely fashion, the kids are on the bus, but also B, because we have a continuity of programs and it goes till 21. And see, because um, as far as expenses, we are under the BOCES cost, which saves them a little bit of money, and they are in with their typical peers. They're not segregated. So that's a huge piece of why um, we are getting the students we're getting, but we're also getting the students because we've made partners with them um, over many years. You know, I had a family call me from New York City because she called a place in southern Westchester, and it's like, oh, if you want a program, this is the school you should call if that's where you're looking to move. So, I mean, the, the, by word of mouth, our teachers are amazing. Our program has really grown. And, you know, and I think districts really want their children to be in a school district that is in a building, a program within the building. So I think that's a big piece of it. And we do the same. And we have kids in MAPAC. We have students that go to other programs other than both these. And some of the public schools, it's a better fit for some of our students. And they're successful. Thank you. Bill, did you have a follow-up question? No. Thank you for uh, clarifying that to the both of you. Okay. Mary Pat, you're next. Thank you. Um, I would just like to speak <clears throat> to the, um, just on a more, I guess, for lack of a better, you know, historical perspective. We had a contingent budget probably about, this, probably about 10 or 12 years ago. Enrique, you might, re I don't know if you were here, if it, were, if it was just when you came in or not. No, it but was before it really, me. It frankly, um, goes to very much a quality of life um, piece. And Barbara, you'll remember it because you were a teacher at the time. It very much affects, I mean, um, you know, at the time my kids were little and they, there was, um, for example, like the Horizons program was shortened. You know, I mean, they, it was, you know, it was a, like a, a much more restricted um I think they, they met much much less frequently. The, the That's sports true. Was the sports was affected. Um, I mean, there was a tremendous amount of out of pocket costs from the parents alone. I mean, they were having to buy things like that the school no longer provided certain notebooks and agendas, and and these are small costs. But it, it was honestly, it was like every time you turned around, there was some other obligation and. You know, something that needed to be either, it's like you either pay for it or it's not going to happen. And a lot of times, many things just, um, you know, programs were cut. And at the high school, I know that there were restricted, you know, classes were um, not offered in certain, you know, during that time because they just couldn't afford it or didn't meet the, the criteria that was established. Um, you know, and aside from the fact that, you know, for somebody like Joe and Enrique and, and frankly, the board as a whole to offer the programs that our kids are used to and that have made us, um, you know, have made us the, di the district that we are. Because the reality is, I mean, for example, the, um, you know, Joe spoke earlier about the different programs that we have, you know, and we're very, the diversity of students, each child gets the program that he needs or, you know, um, they're, you know, they're, programs for the challenged students, there are programs for the stronger students. Um, you know, you mentioned the academy. That's just, you know, some of our at-risk students, you know. Um, Project Lead the Way is, is a program um, each one for all of our students from, you know, both ends of the spectrum, the kids who are much more um, 
you know, who, you know, who are, who, who find school a challenge and for those who, you know, who are taking every AP class they can. Um, it's, we would have to limit that. And frankly, those are the things that, are, um, as strong as it is and get them, pro- you know, provide the outcomes that we are, you know, we're really starting to see, um, and have been seeing. Um, my concern is that these options and these choices would be limited to our students um, if we wind up going to contingency. Um, and, and that's what concerns me because, you know, we've maintained all the way through that the only, you know, that with everything that's going on, if we want to protect the value of our, of our homes and the value of, you know, if, if that's, you know, the the um if we want to protect the value of our homes and and what whatever our what we do value, we need to value and and we have to maintain the educational system that we have. We have to continue offering these programs to give the education system that these kids need, and that you know to produce the outcomes as well as to protect you know your personal investment, whether it's your home or or such. Um, I just think that to go to contingency would absolutely. I mean, aside from the the financial considerations, my concern is what it would do to decimate our program. Um, I mean, it would even, it's, it's almost counterintuitive to have it in the sense that we would have to get rid of programs where we're actually having money come in on them, you know, that's lessening the cost. It would, you know, it works against, it works against us in so many ways, both financially as well as, as programmatically. Um, you know, we again. I went through this bill. Your children were probably in the school at the time. You might remember it. Um, you know, this, Laura, you probably have a few. You know, probably your older daughter went through it too. But it was a it was a problem, and you you really felt it in the school. You felt the the just sort of the restrictions that were imposed, and there were so many like that's not happening, that's not happening, that's limited. That I wouldn't really. I would be very upset if we were not able to give our students all the opportunities that we have been giving them. I mean, it's, that's been our goal all the way through. So, um, you know, I, I sincerely hope that um, I sincerely hope that people are going to be able to see through what we've done with in terms of um, you know in terms of you know that the limitations imposed by Indian Point and what we try to do to mitigate that. Um, and put together a budget that, that works. So, um, you know, the contingency, I, I can tell you, having lived through it that, you know, all those years ago, it was, there's really, there's, it's, there's nothing good about it. There's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't serve anybody's purpose. And it really puts, you know, it, it, it undermines our program. And it's, it, you know, I, I apologize for rambling on, but it's just, it, I, sincerely truly hope that it just it doesn't come to that so um barbara you might be able to speak to some of the experiences oh it was it was uh, i i will just say after living through it and being a teacher through it you know you you don't realize the only the only ones that suffer from this are the kids because they don't have the programs, they don't have the supplies, they don't have the teaching tools. Yes, teachers will go out and purchase these things because they don't want their students to be deprived. And teachers have done this. I've done it in the past. I know my colleagues with me have done it in the past during the contingency budget. But it's, it's not fair. If you want to make a statement, make a statement, shout out to the rafters, but don't deprive children of what they need. And, and, you know, this budget is something that they need to have passed for their educational future, for their education right now. You know, um, programs that we, we have worked so hard in this district to develop these programs, to bring these programs in, to keep class sizes small. I listen to other people, other teachers in other districts who are so upset because they don't have enough social workers, because they don't have enough psychologists because their class sizes are so big that they are unable to give the attention to kids that they these kids need. Special ed kids who have the 
best services around, and they deserve to have those things. Every single child deserves to have the best education we can possibly provide for them, and a contingency budget is depriving them. So as I said, if you want to make a statement, make it another way, but don't vote down this budget. I please am, you know, beside myself at the thought that anybody in this district would have to suffer through a time like that. And that's it. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Lori, Ryan, you're next. That's, well, the, those two are a hard act to follow, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, true. Yeah, yeah, it's true you know, to have to live through it. And, Lori, you're a teacher, too. You know. I, I do I do know. Um, so having, having said all what you guys have yeah. already said, I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the community knows what we're talking about. So whatever way Joe is planning on getting this out, if we could be of any help of doing that, I don't know what kind of virtual meetings he's have. I don't know what kind of um, physical meetings he's having, but um, there's definitely a group that's not in favor, and I hope they do what you say, Barb, and they uh, do it some other way than voting down the budget. But with this mail-in, it really scares me because, you know, the statistics, a lot of people, when they feel very strong about something, that's when they actually do it. So my fear is that people who are for the budget will say, oh, it's going to pass and not mail it in. And people who feel very strongly about not about saying no will mail it in right away. So I think it's um, the next step is to make sure that everyone is well aware of what can happen. And exactly that money piece, because I really think people are confused about how much their taxes are going to go up. They really think their taxes are going up 75 percent, I swear. So whatever way we have to get that message across we have to we have to do that well i think we should also anybody who is listening to the board of education meetings and who can have an impact on other people and reach out to other people in the community please do so you know to make sure that this budget is passed thank you corey No, I don't have anything further. <laughs> okay. Uh, Lisa Anderson? Um, I just, you know, looking at this list of things that could possibly be cut, um, I, I wonder, I don't want to focus there, on there, there, there. Just, there, there's such a, it's such an overwhelming and discouraging list. How did the decision get made about what we actually do cut? Well, you start with your non-mandated programs, and then you look at the number of students that could be impacted by that program. Um, for example, how many students in the elementary school receive reading that are um, not mandated to receive reading? So you you know you look at the impact on kids. Uh, a lot of people like to throw around athletics. Ah, oh, we don't need athletics, so on and so forth. Almost 60% of our middle schoolers and high schoolers uh, play a sport. So if we were to reduce athletics, what sport do you start at? The ones, you know, the sports that doesn't that do not have the turnout. Um, you, that's where that's where you start. You you look at the uh, greatest, or I guess the the least level of impact. Um, Students that have special needs, uh, they receive a program that's a mandate. And an IEP is a contract that we have with kids and families. We have to implement that. But we have a lot of folks um, who provide IEP services that provide additional services to non-IEP students. So we would need to go basically one by one and look at the impact. I, I have in front of me a course offering list from the middle school and high school last year. Um, you know, we may... We may think that, uh, let's see, uh, nine, we may think nine kids taking accelerated studio and art, um, you know, should be reduced and then wait until you hear from those nine kids or the, the 50 in the last number of years that took that class. So, you know, there's no, there's no method to the madness, but where you start is your non-mandated programs and then you back into looking at how many kids would, would be potentially impacted, um, among our lowest 
Uh, among our lowest AP classes are is AP French. Um, reduce AP French, and then you'll hear from those kids and families who, starting in eighth grade, made decisions about their course of study in, fr in, in the language that ultimately led to the capstone experience of competing for a college credit. You know, so the numbers on paper have a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of stories and emotion behind them. And, you know, there will be losers because um, we don't offer programs that kids don't take. So to reduce programs, AP Computer Science, one of our newest classes, has 10 kids in it. Um, you know, on paper, might be an easy one to cut until we hear from those kids and families in the college uh, decisions that they're making based on AP Computer Science or where they're applying or potential career paths. So... Um, you know, to try to separate out the emotion, you start with your non-mandated programs and you look at the number of kids it may impact. It impacts every kid regardless. Some child is going to be impacted and that child's going to impact another child and another child and another child. And that's the sad part. Well, and, and, and I'll add one more thing. I know I'm out of order, Carol. I, I apologize, but... I, I I I came to the district uh, started in 2013 and the budget failed in in 2007. I would say it took us a good 10 years to restore every position that was cut from 2007. That includes uh, art an art teacher that was cut, elementary librarians that were cut, horizons that was cut. Um, elective uh, uh, teachers that were cut. It 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 had a ten year and impact and program. Yeah. And materials and supplies and you and name it. So so the reason I say that it is is you know everyone's entitled to have their vote. Their uh, I, I I hope everyone operates on the same set of facts and principles. But um, you know I read something the other day. That it's a you know it, it's our opportunity to send a message. I get it. That message will hurt kids for at least our history lesson. It hurt kids in this organization for ten years. I'm so happy. I'm not on camera right now because my face is so red. I'm so angry at the thought that this could even be a possibility. It's just so sad to me. Just so sad. Sorry, Carol. Uh, no need to apologize to me. Um, does anybody else have any comments before I wrap this section up? Okay, so thank you very much, everybody, for all of your impassioned um, comments. I would like to make my own comment. Um, every budget vote is an important budget vote. I know people are feeling this year more than others because of this whole COVID episode. A lot of people are furloughed or lost their jobs or uncertain about the future. I get that. I seriously get that. I just hope that people will look at the facts of this budget, um, take into consideration how much work has gone into it, and will vote with the facts in front of them. 